thank you to all of you uh, uh, on behalf of USISPF for taking the time. We are honored and delighted that uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, Professor K. Vijay Raghavan, uh, Dr. Renu Swaroop, uh, Ambassador Taranji Singh Sandhu. And I have to comment that the ambassador has been relentless in supporting all the effort, energy. So a special thank you, Ambassador, to you for making all the effort. And I also would like to say thank you to uh, Joanna Mercier and, and Julie Gerberding for joining us at this event because it is all about India-US partnership and how do we collaborate and support each other in this pandemic itself. And, uh, you know, as I talked about the, the uh, opportunity, uh, I have this opportunity to commend the effort made by the US government and the US industry in partnering with the Indian government and advancing relief material to fight the COVID uh, wave of uh, 19 in India. Uh, I've been working very closely with the uh, Global COVID Task Force and USISPF, and we are committed to supplying uh, 100,000 oxygen concentrator. Uh, we have shipped in 21 oxygen, uh, cryogenic oxygen tanks itself, almost 2 million uh, antigen tests, and we're looking at other antiviral medicine. And this is all in collaboration with the ambassador's office. So we calibrate as sh things shift and, and keep on moving. Uh, things to India. I think it's important to understand when US went through its crisis last year, it was India which stepped up to support US from critical medicine. And as India is going through its own challenges, US has stepped up. So it is a reciprocal partnership where I say, you know, you recognize friend in need is a friend indeed. And I have to compliment both the Indian government and US government uh, trying to support each, each other during this COVID crisis. I, I think it's important uh, as we look at, we move forward because this pandemic will get managed. We're seeing the numbers settling down. How do we collaborate future, both from a drug perspective, from a healthcare po uh, policy perspective, especially also on the IP side uh, between the two countries? So we do have a 90 minutes of discussion and I, I, once again, I'd like to say thank you to the ambassador, to uh, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan, Dr. Swaroop, and others, uh, and, and, and Dr. Fauci for taking this time. So let me let me uh, invite uh, Ambassador uh, to give his opening remarks, and then we'll proceed from there. Ambassador, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, the Chief Medical Advisor to the President, Director. NIAID, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, Principal Scientific Advisor, uh, Dr. Renu Saroop, Secretary Department of Biotechnology, Dr. Mukesh Agi, President USISPF, Distinguished Participant from Gilead, Merck, Bharat Biotech, and dear friends. Thank you for the kind introduction, Mukesh. Uh, we do live in extraordinary times and such times call for exceptional friendships. Over the last six weeks, as India faced an extremely challenging situation, we were heartened to see the United States step up its support for India. So at the outset, let me underline the deep appreciation of government of India for the swift response of the US administration and the private sector in responding to the second wave of the pandemic in India. The manner all our friends in the United States have mobilized at this moment symbolizes the enduring partnership between our two countries. Ever since the pandemic hit last year, we at the embassy have been part of the efforts that have brought Indian and US health experts, government officials, and industry together. This active collaboration has been critical to our efforts to counter the COVID. So over the last few months, we have been asking ourselves and our partners, what are the lessons learned from the ongoing cooperation? What are those elements that have worked? What can we do better going forward? This seminar is a result of those discussions to bring together our leading experts from United States and India to find ways in which we can take forward our cooperation 
intangible way. I am particularly delighted that three of our leading experts, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, and Dr. Renu Suru, have taken time to be here today. Dr. Fauci, in our previous con conversation, we had spoken about how we could harness the extraordinary power of the India-US partnership for our common benefit. I have also been in regular touch with Dr. Vijay Raghavan and Dr. Suru. We are also closely working with the industry. I've spoken to Bharat Biotech and Merck. I'm confident that all these efforts will yield results. As many of you gathered here today know, India-US health co collaboration is not new. Under the long-standing vaccine action program between India and the United States, we developed the Rotavac vaccine against the rotavirus, which causes severe diarrhea in children. Indian companies have also manufactured highly cost-effective HIV drugs for use in African countries, building a cooperation between U.S. organizations and the private sector. Last year, as the pandemic hit, India ensured the integrity of health supply chains, providing essential medicines to the United States and many other countries. This year, when the U.S. supported India during the second wave, President Biden and all the top leaders recalled India's help. Companies such as Gilead and Merck present here today have been critical in supplying essential medicines to India, which has helped us to fight the pandemic and saved in innumerable lives. Underpinning the India-US health collaboration is a strong knowledge and research partnership that bring together our best minds with institutions of excellence in both countries. Today, Indian vaccine companies are collaborating with the US-based agencies to develop and produce additional vaccines against COVID-19 on a rapid platform. Six such vaccines are under development. Needless to say, these partnerships are made possible by the stories of individuals who have benefited from working in both countries. Many Indian scientists and entrepreneurs began their careers as students in the United States. Even today, more than 200,000 Indian students are present in the United States and mostly in STEM areas. Their innovation and entrepreneurship have led to breakthrough technologies, creating value and advancing the global good. The Bharat biotech couple are a shining example of this phenomena between our two countries. The current COVID has also revealed the challenges of an interconnected world in which a single vaccine may require items sourced from 50 or even more countries. As India ramps up vaccine production to cater to our needs and those of the world, we rely on the support of the United States in ensuring raw materials and component items are available in good supply. Vaccinating the world is our best bet against another wave of pandemic and the ideal way to speed economic recovery. Beyond vaccines, a renewed focus on healthcare will remain a priority for the world. India already enjoys significant advantages in pharmaceutical sector. Affordable medicines are manufactured in India by generic drug companies and have been a lifeline to India and the developing world. Indian firms supply almost 40% of generic formulations marketed in the United States. Many of these companies have set up manufacturing facilities in the US, providing a source of jobs and investment while offering high quality medicines that are also affordable to a wider section of the population. And under the framework of India-US Health Dialogue initiated in 2015, there are extensive exchanges in the areas of biomedical research to low-cost innovations. Even beyond Indian investments in the U.S. healthcare sector, India is also a trusted partner for sourcing key starting materials and active pharmaceutical ingredients. As the U.S. and other countries attempt to ensure that these inputs are not single country dependent, India remains a ready partner for creating a reliable, resilient, and seamless supply chain. The announcement of 
PLI in pharmaceutical and medical devices sector provide an opportunity for the US companies to enhance investments in India. Looking ahead, we need to invest in preparing for the future. Future global resilience will depend on how well prepared we are in dealing with future pandemics. We need to work further expand our bilateral programs in areas such as epidemiology, digital health, patient safety to tackle communicable and non-communicable diseases and improve infectious diseases modeling, prediction and forecasting. Similarly, sharing of clinical expertise, standards and experiences of hospitals in the management of infectious diseases, especially COVID-19, would add to the knowledge base in handling similar crises in the future. I am certain that the discussions today will shed new light on to the valuable lessons of last year and bring our focus to transformative partnership that will benefit our two countries and the world at large. The pandemic has once again proven that health remains our real wealth. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, for those words of wisdom. I think it's important to look at how we manage our secure healthcare supply chain and R&D and better collaboration between two countries. So thank you once again for what you do for us, Ambassador. Our next speaker is, is uh, does not need much of an introduction. Uh, he is a, a known brand globally and uh, as a director of U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and also chief medical advisor to the President of the United States, Dr. Anthony Fauci has been serving U.S. Uh, for the last seven presidents. And, and I have to say that I got to meet him last Monday while I was jogging in D.C. And so was he jogging. And at his age, he still runs four miles every day. And so, you know, the message is, is while you can take the medicine, you have to have the discipline to take care of your health also. So Dr. Anthony Fauci. Warm greetings to you all. My name is Tony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and the chief medical advisor to President Biden. I very much appreciate being invited to help launch this seminar on learning from COVID-19 experiences. And to make a few comments about our important and ongoing Indo-United States infectious diseases research collaborations. First, please accept my sincere empathy for the extremely difficult public health crisis India is currently facing. As you know, the United States was in a similar position several months ago before vaccines became available. With the discovery and use of effective vaccines achieved in record time, we all now understand the critical role that science plays in addressing such a crisis. I trust that today's meeting will help garner additional support for research and innovation as the source of public health and medical interventions that will end this devastating pandemic. The National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases has a long history of collaboration with our counterpart agencies in the government of India. Under the long-standing Indo-US Vaccine Action Program, we will continue to work with India on research related to SARS-CoV-2 vaccines and adjuvants. We also are eager to involve Indian investigators in sites in global clinical trials to evaluate the safety and efficacy of various COVID-19 therapeutics. The U.S.-India partnerships between the NIH and India's Department of Biotechnology, as well as with the Indian Council of Medical Research, have helped produce important scientific and public health discoveries in the past. I am confident they will continue to do so in the future. India's contributions to global scientific knowledge are well known to all. With strong governmental support and a vibrant biopharma private sector, this knowledge already 
is yielding solutions to COVID-19 prevention and care. From my point of view, to control the pandemic, we must do even more to discover and test safe and effective therapeutics and vaccines. This means that it is critical for all of us to do everything we can to facilitate the rapid implementation of this research. As for the subject of this meeting, I would just highlight a few lessons I have learned from our COVID-19 experience. First, to prevent and control infectious disease, we must rely on well-designed and validated scientific approaches to guide effective public health and clinical practice. Second, international cooperation and collaboration are essential to advance scientific discovery and to manage global health threats. Third, research is greatly enhanced when the public sector and government work together and combine their strengths. Fourth, we must address inequities in our health systems so that future epidemics are not a burden primarily borne by disadvantaged populations. And finally, we all need to make sure that the public receives accurate evidence-based guidance from health officials and political leadership. I hope these and other lessons learned will be more thoroughly discussed over the next few hours, and I look forward to hearing the outcome of this seminar. And in closing, I want to express appreciation for our long-standing Indo-US partnerships and pledge that NIAID will continue its commitment to this collaboration, which greatly benefits our two countries and the entire world. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today and best wishes for a successful meeting. Let me, let me just uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan, who is uh, uh, the principal scientific advisor to the PMO government of India. And uh, he was appointed as the principal scientific advisor in 2018. And prior to this, he served as secretary department of biotechnology, government of India. Professor Raghavan was also the director of National Center for Biological Sciences of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and the interim head of the Tata Institute of Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine, a new autonomous institute of the Department of Biotechnology. His contribution in science as development biologist has been recognized widely around the world. Professor Vijay Raghavan, over to you. Thank you very much, Mukesh. Um, I don't know whether, which is more difficult, um, going before uh, Dr. Fauci or after, um, but um, it's a great honor to be here and in this uh, company, and these are very trying times, and working together is very important. Before I start, I'd like to um, thank my colleagues in the Department of Biotechnology, Indian Council for Medical Research, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research for um, allowing me to helping me develop my thoughts and also you know scientists all over the world particularly uh, for today david robertson from glasgow and jesse bloom from the fred hutch at seattle whose work has uh, been instrumental in helping me uh, formulate my thoughts so i will give an overview of how our understanding of the evolving virus is helping us succeed against it particularly in terms of vaccine development but before I start, let me say something which cannot be stressed enough. This is a very critical time in our country and in the whole world. And this is a time for all of us to work together and ensure that we in India and the world get out of this pandemic. Now, this is happening. Scientists within and outside government, non-government organizations have come together. This is an international partnership and sharing of experiences happening. And has been said many times, but it's true, that no one is safe until all are safe. Now, the first and most immediate task we have is doing everything we can now and together to help those who are currently impacted. Now, it is a very difficult for us to see what is happening all around us and all over the world, to see the suffering, and all our thoughts and efforts are on this. 
And of course, we must continue to strengthen all of this. Healthcare workers, frontline workers, work for patients and their families, work with those who can you know, ensure supply chains, with NGOs, with scientists, and make sure that we overcome this huge pressure on our public health system. Now, I'd like to address three points briefly, and these are what can we do, what does the virus do, and what do vaccines do now and going ahead? Now, what we can and should do is simply Warm state it, but not easy to implement. There is fatigue Fauci, the all around us. Institute. The best Biology time for us to change our behavior, however, is now. The chief At every Advisor level, from individuals, Biden. families, communities, local government, state government, central government, what we need to do is maximally and effectively maintain distance, ventilation, wear masks, and follow COVID-appropriate behavior. This is very important because distancing can rapidly bring down spread and the virus can only go from human to human uh, if we are close to each other. In each context, and it's very difficult in each context, we need to follow COVID appropriate behavior, which is most effective. Now, what does the virus do? The virus, of course, goes from human to human. And in the process, we know that it can change. We can keep track of the virus and how it moves and changes. And we can use our understanding to protect ourselves and attack the virus with antibodies and with vaccines. Now, what we need to do, however, does not change because of the new variants which we're seeing. And that's something important for the general public and all of us to understand. Masks and distancing and ventilation are still critical and the most effective non-pharmacological interventions against the virus. The virus, the variants don't travel in any way different from the original strain. And the higher transmissibility of some variants is upon infection. So it's the same message, then the variants don't alter this message. And the vaccines also are effective against the current variants, so speedy vaccination is important. Now, new variants will arise all over the world and in India too. And while variants which increase transmission will likely plateau, immune evasive variants and those which lower or decrease disease severity can possibly arise. Now, scientists in India and all over the world are working to anticipate what these kinds of variants could be and how we can act rapidly against them, what are the early warning signs, and how can we be ready for that. This requires both molecular biology and laboratory tools, but also surveillance, genome surveillance, on an effective scale. Now, it is with active molecular and genome surveillance in India and all over the world that we'll be able to deal with the current and future forms of virus. And I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about that from Dr. Renu Swarup, who's heading this initiative. Now, let us look at the variants we have today. Many factors have contributed to the current situation, and the variants are just one factor. Now, last year, we had a big surge, and that declined. What, was the fact, what are the factors which contributed to the decline? As infections rose, so did immunity amongst those who were infected. And people in general, those who were not infected also, took cautionary steps. And at every one of these kinds of cautionary steps, there was less opportunities for infections to spread. So a combination of the standing level of immunity at that time, whatever it was, and cautionary steps also spread, unless new opportunities arise. Now, why is there an increase now? because there are new opportunities which were given. If cautionary steps decline, new opportunities for spread arise. And if we drop our guard, the level of caution drops and the standing level of immunity may not be enough for, to stop further infections. More people get infected and we, this will happen until we hit another threshold where again cautionary steps and immunity prevent further spreads. So, Variants are important, but these principles about having a cautionary set of cautionary steps in place and of not having opportunity are also, in fact, very, very important. Now, what roles do variants play and how was the virus, the sars corona 2 virus, successful in, with such speed? Now, this virus emerged in late 2019 in Wuhan city, Hubei, China, and it's linked to a horseshoe bat Sarbecovirus uh, reservoir that is a clear sister lineage to the lineage SARS emerged from. Now, SARS-CoV-2 will infect many mammal species, such as minks, cats, dogs, etc., indicating that it's not 
a specifically human adapted virus. It has a generalist property and therefore did not need to change much, if at all, after emergence. And this is what we saw much of 2019. Yet we are now seeing evolutionary signals showing evidence for further for adaptation uh, from the on the progenitor lineage, which we have. For much of uh, 2020, um, there was a relatively slow accumulation of mutations. And except there was one uh, significant one, the spike amino acid change, D614G. But towards the later part of last year, from about October 2020 to now, we've seen rather interesting changes. And a very important one was B117. Did we predict the rise of these variants? B117, you know, the B1351, the P1, etc. Now, while there were again, you know, spike amino acid changes which were there, it was clear that the level of evolution which we saw could happen, but B117 was a surprise. Now, in this context, it's important for us to keep in mind what the role of the spike protein is, and all our vaccine experts here know that only too well. Most antibodies targeting uh, target the same accessible region, the receptor binding motif, or the RBM, which interacts with the ACE2 receptor and has high plasticity, and it tolerates relatively frequent changes. And this kind of toleration of frequent changes indicates that antigenic change is also I mean, certain to happen. Now, the known antigenic variation to antibodies tends to accumulate in one domain of the protein, and antibody classes of different kinds target the same parts of the spike protein. So there's been continued evolution in these regions against the specific parts of the protein. Now, the data indicates that the host environment changed towards the end of 2020, such that new variants, which seem to have a higher fitness compared to the ancestral older variants, are taking over. Now, there was a full expectation of such drift, but how come there's so much change and what gives with all of this converging to this particular region? So there's a lot of evolutionary changes taking place with speed, as one would expect in a virus. Now, the changes in biology which we see, for example, with B117, indicates that the virus phenotype is moving through um, a new mode from you know, having hit upon an open and susceptible population to a new one where it has a different kind of lifestyle, where conformational changes, better binding, uh, you know, changes in the ORF allow it to rapidly attack and move away. So there's a changes in the way which the variants function and that you can see in the increased transmissibility. So in, in as some people have commented, um, this has moved from being a generalist, as it were, to having mechanisms indicative of being a specialist. Now, this efficiency of the virus is not just a property of the virus. It's a property of its overall in, um, success and depends a lot on the host, how we are, how susceptible we are, whether we are older people or those with comorbidities, uh, those which have those who have immune um, uh, response issues, so all of that alters the efficiency of the virus. In 2020, the variants were very fit in a highly susceptible population, and now the new variants are fitter with increasing host immunity due to uh, even when there's increasing host immunity due to previous infections. Now the future variants which you might see will be linked to success, their success, in the context of high vaccination and previous infection. And therefore, it is very, very important for us to address these issues speedily so that those kinds of variants, uh, likelihood of arising is minimized or eliminated. Now, this virus was successful very quickly uh, for many, many kinds of reasons. The variants which we see represent better adaptation. They are tr triggered by a population which moved from being very susceptible to less susceptible. Therefore, there's selective pressure. And the pressure to avoid uh, antigenic uh, uh, you know, host immunity from uh, previous infection, um, you know, from dominating, selects for this kind of 
uh, hit and run approaches. So these are the you know situations as far as the virus goes. Now, what next? Where do we go from here? Now, previous infections and vaccines will likely cause, and we know from analyzing the domains of the virus, a pressure for further change. The B117 is worrying, the B617 is now, uh, you know, again, a variant of concern, and it's taken over large populations of the virus, is dominating both in India and in Europe. And yet, the vaccines continue to show efficacy, uh, but ongoing surveillance is needed. There have been very valuable recent studies, both in India and in the UK, on the 617 variant, indicating that uh, you know, while there's substantial protection, there is good protection against severe disease, uh, we need to vaccinate so that we have protection against mild and moderate disease also. So the new variants which we see are, of course, a issue which has to be addressed. And we can't do too much about the variants which are already there from the perspective of the virus. But we can do something very important, which is update our vaccine strategies. And that is what is happening, both in terms of speedily vaccinating with currently available vaccines, developing new vaccines against the variants, having booster doses. All of this allows you know, vaccines which uh, prevent the virus from escaping immunity. So we have learned a lot of lessons historically from other viruses, from the measles virus, for example, which doesn't escape immunity from the influenza virus, which evolves to escape uh, immunity. And it looks like, you know, with the SARS coronavirus 2, we will need to have a mechanism where we keep great track, examine them against, ex um, examine the viruses against extant vaccines and make sure that we update our vaccination program while completing it right now. But it's very important to know that while we have genome surveillance and you look at how vaccines are going to be deployed and changed and so on uh, from the field, we also need to have a complementary approach which doesn't have to wait for the vari variants to occur before we understand where they could come from. So the laboratory work which modifies every antigenic domain in a manner to test for potential vaccines and how they can be are very important, which then allows us to be prepared against the, uh, the variants as they arise. So we can measure how the mutations in the receptor binding domain, for example, affect antibody binding. You can use a variety of laboratory tricks to map all the mutations uh, which alter antibody binding. So these have resulted in many laboratories, for example, in the US, um, to develop maps for um, escape maps, as they're called, for many lead clinical antibodies. So monoclonal antibodies which go against specific domains, if those domains change, new monoclonal antibodies can come. And vaccines, of course, are against multiple domains. So vaccine evasiveness is a much more difficult task for the virus to accomplish. And yet those measures can also be taken. Okay, to conclude, some viruses evolve to erode immunity, such as influenza, others like measles don't. But SARS human coronaviruses are something which we can see are evolving, and therefore we must monitor the viral evolution and monitor vaccine updates. Now, whether disease will in these kinds of reinfections will be milder or more severe, we don't know. I mean, there are many kinds of scenarios possible. It's possible that new variants are much milder, but we don't know yet. Now, the new um, variants will, of course, have changes in important domains, but it will take multiple years, and we don't know how long, to accumulate enough mutations to evade vaccine polyclonal antibody neutralization. That gives us time to vaccinate the whole world and have booster doses to vaccinate again if needed periodically. So this is something which is very reassuring. We've got a route which we can take now by understanding the variants and how they change, how they affect um, the vaccine or antibody uh, neutralization and, and what we can do to address that. Now, the bottom line is, while all this is going on, again and again, we have to reiterate that this doesn't change our requirement for masks and distancing and, and ventilation. Given the higher transmissibility of some variants, this is most important. 
Vaccines are our most effective tool getting out, and that program is being ramped up, as you will hear from others uh, in India and all over the world, and no one is safe until the entire world is safe. And new variants will arise, and with each variant, there will be a plateau of transmission and immune evasiveness variants, and those which lower or increase disease severity may arise, and we need to be prepared for that. And scientists in India and all over the world are working to anticipate you know, what these kinds of changes are. We are, you know, learned a lot this year, particularly with the rise of the variants, and we've got better tools. All of us working together will now be able to address these kinds of issues, but it's very important to realize that this is a global effort of global collaboration, and we must really plan to vaccinate all those who need to be vaccinated all over the world, and that must be the critical effort, uh, effort both in the development of vaccines and in their deployment. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan. Uh, your message is clear. We all need to get vaccinated. And uh, before we get into Q&A, let me invite uh, Dr. Renu Saroop, Secretary, Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India, to give her opening remark. Let me just give you a little background on her. Uh, she serves as the Secretary, Department of Biotechnology, Prior to this, she served in Department of Biotechnology for nearly 29 years as senior advisor and uh, until she got appointed to Government of India in 2018. She also holds a position of Chairperson Biotechnology Industry Research Assistant Council and a, a public sector company incorporated by Government of India to nurture and promote innovation research in biotech enterprise with special focus on startups and SMEs. I think, but more important is she's quite engaged in the activities related to women and science. And as you look at uh, uh, at NASA and other areas, we have Indian Americans who are quite involved in, in science. So uh, Dr. Sarup, it's such a delight to have you here uh, as a women leader working on biotechnology and science. So over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, Pleasure to be here, all of you, and uh, thank you, Professor Vijayaragman, for setting such an important uh, tone for this entire discussion. Dr. Fauci, uh, we will surely hear his talk uh, subsequently, I'm sure, but all of you here, Ambassador Kesh, each one, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for having me with you here. The key theme that uh, we're all discussing is what really COVID has taught us. And I think for the Indo-US partnership, I can clearly say one thing, that COVID has reinforced our, our uh, strong conviction that collaboration is the key to success as we move forward. And I think that has come out so strongly in this COVID times. The spotlight on science and technology, delivering solutions for emergency situations such as this, and the strength that collaboration brings to accelerate that has come out through these COVID times. India and US have always shared a wonderful partnership in all areas of collaboration, whether it's health, whether it's agriculture, clean energy. I think the key point that connects us is we collectively take on challenges to deliver, not just to our own countries, but to the globe. And I think that is a common commitment that we have, which binds us so beautifully to move ahead. Uh, the Department of Biotechnology, which is uh, just about 35 years into existence as a separate department of the government of India. Before that, we were part of the larger Ministry of Science and Technology. And I think the first key partnership that we took on was the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program, which was mentioned by the ambassador. And uh, that really is one of our very, very strong foundations on which we've built all our strength as we move ahead. And in these many years, the strength of this partnership of the Vaccine Action Program has actually delivered to us a number of key vaccines. Rotavirus, I'm so pleased to see Sai Prashad here, are the key movers with Dr. M.K. Bhan, and of course, the strength of the Indo-US uh, WAP leadership and partnership, which helped us to move ahead many others after that. And the strength of that partnership is, it's not just about funding. 
It's about a partnership which brings in leadership, which brings in a commitment to say, how do we tackle a problem together? And I think that is so important in today's time to see how we move ahead. We've had under the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program, many other components that we've worked on. And there's been, there's been a lot of science, there's been from research to development, to translation, to delivery, all aspects get covered in it. So it brings in all our stakeholders. It brings in the researchers the, from the academia, from the industry, brings in the policy makers. And that's how we look at new things that evolve for us to move ahead. We've had more than 11 vaccine candidates other than COVID. The COVID itself has brought about six or seven to us, but other than COVID, we had nearly about 11 which have gone through vaccine action program partnerships. More than anything else, it was, I think, just about two years or three years back that uh, we began discussing with Niyad and other team members from NIH the need to strengthen our partnership on adjuvants. How do we actually develop adjuvants? And in today's time, when we are all accelerating the pace of our vaccine development, we do realize the value of adjuvants. And these centers of adjuvant development that we have collectively put together, I'm sure if what they would serve purpose now, but moving forward, they're going to be so very important. Because it's not just about the technology. As I said, it's also about building the critical mass of human resource training, capacity building, access to research resources. I think that whole ecosystem is so important. And that's what we build through this partnership with the US that we are taking forward. We also have under the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program, some excellent other models of clinical trial sites, our whole program on tuberculosis, the report sites, which are not only in India now, they've moved on to other places, setting up bio repositories. So it's looking at each aspect which would contribute to say, how do we look at responding to challenges in healthcare? In addition to vaccines, we've also had partnerships that we've looked at for monoclonal antibodies or therapeutics. And today, if you look at our whole biomedical innovation area, I think the first major entrepreneurial venture that the Department of Biotechnology began was in our India uh, Stanford Biodesign Program, the Stanford India Biodesign Program as it was called, which was the, the point that we started our whole entrepreneurial activities. Today, of course, we have a number of biodesign centers, innovation biodesign centers, but the first one that we set up with Stanford, uh, All India Institute at Delhi and IIT Delhi, which really today has been able to give us more than 40 to 50 startups and entrepreneurs who brought in medical technologies, innovations, many of which are today coming uh, they are already in the market, but for COVID times also they've responded. So you see, I think all that we invested in, in terms of our partnership, is paying such rich dividends today. Because it's that foundation that we've built upon so very quickly. Otherwise, when the pandemic struck us, it was not going to be easy to build new partnerships to be able to take it forward. And that too, when we're all in a virtual world, it's very difficult to bring in these connections. So I think that really was the strength that we have taken on. It's also important to remember this, that as I spoke about the larger ecosystem, we have been able to build very strong partnerships from the research academic institutes, the industry, uh, which we see represented here, but also a very vibrant and robust startup ecosystem. And that, again, has been fueled with this collaboration and partnership from the rich advice and mentoring that it gets from, from the mentors on either side. In fact, the first sister innovation hub, as we called it, that we set up in India, connecting incubators was with the US. The C camp at Bangalore signed the first such MOU with the QB3 in the Bay Area. And today we have exchange of startups, giving them soft landing spaces. And that's moved not just within the US to other locations. We have partnerships now with the Boston Group area. We have partnerships with um, Karolinska Group. We have partnerships with uh, the Edinburgh Group. Many such partnerships that we built in with many other incubators. But again, I think it was our Indo-US partnership which, which set the foundation for it. Coming specifically to the COVID times, how did this help us? And we've all seen in these last 
year and a half that we've all been struck with this, the key area that the which we've all looked at, and uh, Dr. Vijayaraghavan alluded to it, was the vaccine development. Now you do have uh, Sai Prashad who's going to talk about our first co-vaccine, which is into the immunization program. And that again, as I said, the Indo-US collaboration, the vaccine uh, action program is definitely a, a strength to these activities. We have many more such candidates, which we are now working with, which are in advanced stages. You have the biological E candidate, which uh, today there was a huge press release about the government putting out a pre-order to that. And we are very pleased from the department that we've been supporting it. Again, it has the full endorsement of the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program. The mRNA vaccine, which is being developed by Genova, once again in collaboration with the US group, but again, full endorsement from the Vaccine Action Program. There are, there are many other such that we are talking about. Bharat itself has a couple of other candidates, and I leave that to Sai Prashad to talk about their portfolio of vaccines that they're bringing out for, uh, for uh, COVID. But the strength is, again, I, as I said, it's connecting with the groups. There are different areas that we need to connect on. We had, in fact, a wonderful model, which uh, the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology has partnered with Dr. Rafi Ahmed's Emory Center. So we have an Emory Center and ICGP. And today in the COVID times, we immediately took on a program for monoclonal antibodies. Excellent results. And we are hoping that we would be able to move this towards industry, a partnership to take it ahead. And what's the basis of this? Our, our strength in this is we have an overarching uh, ST agreement, which gives us the strength of intellectual property right discussions, et cetera. But more than anything else, it gives us an understanding of how the two nations collaborate to take health and health-related solutions forward. Variants, Dr. Vijay Raghavan has already given you an elaborate understanding of how important they are. In our recent discussions, which in fact, during these COVID times, we've had more than three or four discussion meetings with the NIH team, with Dr. Fauci, Crane, all the others to discuss how we could look at some of these opportunities of collaboration. And in the recent discussion that we had, the area of the variants, looking at how our vaccines respond to it, looking at the data analysis, the computational part of it has come up as a key area of research collaboration. And in the next couple of weeks, that would be built upon, again, to add value to how we respond. So I'll conclude by saying this, that we have immense opportunities the strength of this collaboration has given us a lot of confidence in how we can work in all areas, from vaccines to therapeutics, to diagnostics, to human resource, to the ecosystem, all of it. It's important for us to see how we use this wonderful platform to move ahead. And moving forward, where do we see this going? I think we all do understand this. This is probably not going to be the last pandemic. There are many, many other such emergent situations. We have the antimicrobial research area. Going other than health, we have, and which also has a health impact, is our whole area of climate change, which again has such. All these we are partnering with the US strongly. And I think moving ahead, the spotlight on science and technology delivering is definitely going to stay. The, the collaborations, if any way they're going to move, it's going to be an exponential both because everyone recognizes the strength of this collaboration. So if we're going to see something moving ahead, it's going to be an exponential growth of this partnership. But it's for us as a group to recognize how we utilize best the strength of this partnership. And as I said, you heard the ambassador talk about how wonderfully India and US have done these reciprocal arrangements in the first and the second wave. So it's all the way from research to technology to development, to manufacture. We're having discussions on looking at tech transfers for manufacture and delivery of actual solutions. So it's a broad spectrum. We do hope that we'll be able to take it ahead and we hope that this dialogue continues and we can build more and more partnerships. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Swaroop, for your wonderful message and focusing collaboration. <clears throat> well, um, you know, the principal functional challenge amongst communities we have with this pandemic is the extent and speed of 
asymptomatic transmission which lulls people in a situation where you know a first wave for example has come down and therefore people at every level have difficulty in seeing potential exponential rise again so that is the uh, important situation which um, we need to address so it's possible to you know build surge capacity which is about 40% 50% more than what you already have but it's very difficult in any system to build surge capacity twice or thrice of what you have and therefore the only way to deal with surges is to simultaneously while building surge capacity also do every measure to prevent people from getting hospitalized by a variety of measures which i talked about so we are now seeing a you know after this extraordinary rise we're seeing a speedy decline and we must again be remember that we will if you're not careful if you become careless again anywhere in the world you're going to see again rises until everyone's vaccinated so it's important not to be lulled into complacency now about how long it will take for people to get vaccinated we must remember two things one india has got a very strong immunization program and you know there have been times during our earlier vaccination programs where we have vaccinated you know literally 100 over 100 million people in a day very coordinated effort which goes boom now right now the situation is this is an unusual adult vaccination program which needs to vaccinate pretty much substantial parts of our population that requires a combination of logistics which are in place and a programmatic distribution of supplies which are ramping up in june july august september and the government has announced a very ambitious program to put in, put in place supplies of various kinds and to have deployment which will cover a very large number of people by december everything has to work correctly for that there are of course uncertainties which have been built in but let us see just today we had a very important announcement of a major partnership uh, which will allow one of our companies uh, i don't know whether they're here biological e to start uh, uh, you know uh, having vaccines a new vaccine um, by fall this year uh, the others bharat biotech sputnik um, uh, serum institute uh, and other vaccine purchases will allow this kind of a massive deployment to take place thank you thank you uh, professor vijayaragun let, let me ask uh, dr swaroop uh, you know there's a tremendous potential which is happening collaboration between us and india on r and d and india becomes a global i say hope for vaccine supply to the rest of the world but at the same time the challenges which us companies uh, see on the ip side so how do you find that balance between trying to collaborate at the same time protecting ip also so as i said uh, see let's look at the covid time first of all i think here there has been very good discussion which is moving ahead and the us has also spoken about it in which we are talking about global access and ip sharing etc but even if you look at our earlier collaborations within our own group in fact some of the own our own industries who are moving forward they have been able to take this on very well it's all about identifying the right objective it's all about coming up with a, a commitment that we would share together and we've had very good examples of ip sharing we've had very good examples of tech transfers of others which can be emulated and with the us as i said there have been some extremely good models in the r and d itself we are governed by the snt agreement which there is a consensus on both sides in terms of what the ip sharing would be so with the us for r and d we've really had some wonderful examples of uh, collaboration and ip sharing moving forward to the industrial part of it to the uh, manufacturing commercial again you have the industries here in fact uh, many of them which i spoke about just now which are into vaccine development 
have in fact some of the academic collaborations where they've already sorted out their IP arrangements for it. So these models do exist, but yes, they do have to be taken up on a case by case basis, but it's something which is has been done and can definitely be done future uh, on an accelerated speed as well. Thank you. And 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 uh, as a follow up question before I go to uh, Professor Raghwan, is is you know what can the industry do on the vision of affordability and scalability on healthcare in India. You know, this is a very important question which ranges all over from the fundamentals of the healthcare system right up to high tech like vaccines and antibodies. Now, right at the fundamental, what this has highlighted, what this pandemic has highlighted is that public health system not only have to cater for routine preventive care, but at times they have to cater to a very strong uh, requirement of intensive care on a large scale. So what we have learned from here is the following. We need to have a mechanism by which intensive care can rapidly be put in place where needed by deploying other industries, other areas which are functioning into a surge requirement of this kind. But even at normal times, there is a lesson that intensive care available in small towns and villages will greatly help in preventing the load on larger facilities. That requires, in addition to facilities, training. So I would say that the most important lesson we have learned for public health is large scale training across this range of medicine, which is required. And that's something we should embark on. It's very good, it's gonna be complicated, it will involve both in-person and telemedicine training, but it's something which is feasible and we should put that. Now, secondly, in terms of you know, the other end of the spectrum, vaccines, antibodies, therapeutics, and so on. The fact is that this pandemic has taught us that we must balance the kind of challenges required in R&D development, the costs, the intense care which is needed, the regulatory steps which have gone, all of which add up to the cost rather substantially, from a large scale public health demand of you know, frugal innovation and its consequences as everything being affordable. That again is feasible, that requires partnership between governments, insurance agencies, industry and people. And that's something we must learn so that healthcare is affordable to everyone while making sure that the highest range of technology development is not impaired. That's feasible. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Let me ask final question with Dr. Swarup. Uh, you know, R&D is so critical, and, and the, the talent we have in India is fantastic, especially from R&D perspective. So what would be your message uh, to the U.S. companies as they look at India as R&D for the future development? And how would you encourage them to come in and leverage the sources and, and the uh, intellectual capacity of Indian professionals? So uh, I did speak about the partnership in all these years. And if you look at the changing landscape within our own Indian research ecosystem, we do have now a lot of focus on looking at these knowledge driven clusters where we have been able to. And I did speak about a robust ecosystem that we've created for the startup. So we have examples of good research moving from laboratories the startup ecosystem to industry. I think this model that we've been able to do in a few places within the country is something that can exponentially be taken ahead if we build this through a collaboration. Because in the US, you already have these wonderful clusters. And these are the ones which really need to now look at bringing in collaboration, not just on a you know, individual industry level, but trying to see how these clusters collaborate. Because if these clusters collaborate, you are being able to take right from the research, human resource. This also then becomes an advantage because you are looking at some of the key strengths that we have within the country, which can be amplified and value addition can be done through the expertise and the best practices which would come in from the US. If the research collaborations eventually lead to development and manufacture that's really what we are looking at and it also answers the first point that we just had in the question before this 
how do you look at affordability and accessibility? I think affordability and accessibility is all about scale up. And for scale up, you need to look at some of these manufacturing bases in countries like India. You look at this part of the world, you try and see how you use these as bases for scaling up. And we've done this. We've got our vaccines as our biggest example in which we've been able to see this trend. We could take it to other areas. You could take it to monoclonals. You could take it to therapeutics. Today, monoclonals is the next area that we need to focus on. And I think there, the key challenge is affordability and accessibility. So training, capacity building, uh, looking at these models together collectively with a collective vision. I think the US industry needs to come and take on some of our clusters and see how we can build these cluster partnerships rather than now looking at just research and incubator partnership. So let cluster partnership be the next model for us to move ahead. Thank you, Dr. Saroop. And I will be asking that question in our next panel discussion with the industry. I just want to say thank you to both of you for taking the time. I know you're fighting a pandemic and you're busy with your schedule, but thank you once again, and I wish you well and all the safety as you uh, work on this uh, crucial effort within India. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me let me invite uh, the uh, industry panel because I'm cautious of time and trying to make sure that we move uh, on schedule. And our, our topic of the panel discussion is ongoing cooperation in therapeutic vaccines and diagnostic, a pathway to global health, uh, industry perspective. And we have three key companies and three key leaders uh, from the industry. We have Gilead Sciences. We are from India, Bharat Biotech. And we have Merck from uh, from the U.S. And we have Ms. Joanne Mercier, who is uh, responsible for as a chief commercial officer from Gilead Sciences. And, and then Sai Prasad, uh, who is the executive director of Bharat Biotech. And, and then Julie, uh, uh, who is responsible as the executive vice president and chief pa patient officer. So I'm going to move fast, and I invite Joanna to give her opening remarks, followed by Sai Prasad. So Joanna, over to you. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, maybe just at a high level, give a little bit of opening remarks around who Gilead is, um, and obviously the um, the role that we believe we've played in this pandemic or the small piece of that puzzle. So Gilead is a biopharmaceutical company um, really recognized for pioneering over 25 innovative medicines over about the last three decades or so, namely in antivirals. So, and that's important as we talk about COVID-19 and that expertise coming through. It's helped transform people living with HIV, developing the world's first single tablet regimen, also think um, developing the first medicines to prevent HIV infection as well. And we continue to pursue new kinds of treatment within HIV, namely long acting um, agents, as well as the ultimate goal, which is the cure. Building on our success with HIV, we also um, had the same tenacity with Hep C virus, delivering four curative treatments in uh, the less than four years. And today, more than 4 million people have been prescribed our HCV therapies. That expertise was actually critical as you think about COVID-19 pandemic. And it, it um, really played an important role in our response because we had the expertise in-house in virology. So as the first reports, you know, December 19, everybody's spoken about that, kind of came through. Gilead started working pretty much around the clock um, to do everything possible to be part of the solution. And, and we, we did a lot of proactive investments. We did some, some investments at risk, not really knowing um, kind of how it was all going to play out, both from accelerated clinical trial development, but also manufacturing standpoint. We zeroed in on a drug candidate called remdesivir, which I'm sure you, many of you have heard about, um, or Vicluri as the branded name. And, and we saw that the drug actually had, you know, had some activity both in vitro and then in vivo against COVID-19. This is um, a compound that actually was studied years ago and studies for SARS, for MERS, and had had activity both in lab and preclinical studies, but never had come to market um, for, for those diseases. The, um, the, the research then obviously moved very quickly. And, and we talk a lot about partnership this morning. And, and I have to say that that's how we were able to do it so fast. It wasn't Gilead alone. It was Gilead with so many different government agencies, 
um, include in NIAID, um, as well as um, uh, many researchers and scientists around the world. And I just want to say a big thank you because it was only possible thanks to that partnership. We also recognized um, that, you know, public health is important here and the scientific discovery of remdesivir was critical, but if the scientific discovery doesn't, doesn't move into access and affordability, as was mentioned earlier, then it's, it, it's obsolete um, very quickly. And, and that is something Gilead takes very much to heart, that commitment to broad access around the world. And that includes low and middle income countries. So building on past legacy, we, um, we actually, and this is important as we think about the second surge of COVID-19, but about a year ago, so last May 2020, we actually signed non-exclusive voluntary licensing agreements with nine manufacturers to expand access to generic remdesivir in over 127 countries. Seven of those generic manufacturers were actually in India, and, um, and all of these were royalty-free um, agreements during the pandemic. And really the intent of this was to ensure that we provided um, the technical know-how that basically the formula for remdesivir so that these generic manufacturers can produce quickly and make it affordable for all. And that was really the goal. That is exactly what helped us manage the surge that we've just seen over the last few months in India. And because of that infrastructure that was created about a year ago. And, and so the, there was really two main actions, and that's what I'll focus on. The, we, we supported those, those seven voluntary licensing agreements, generic manufacturers in India, to ramp up production very quickly. Production of remdesivir is a very complicated process. Many of the chemical reactions are linear, and, and so there, therefore it, it can take over six months from start to finish, from raw materials to finished product. And, and so what we did, working with the farm school development manufacturing team at Gilead, partnering them with the Indian generic manufacturers to see how do they accelerate? How do you build out? How do you get more local manufacturers to build out production as quickly as possible? And so that was probably the first piece. That addressed more of a medium term. So it's good, it was gonna take a couple of weeks. We feel that we're in a much better place today as we speak. But uh, six weeks ago, that wasn't the case. And so the second action we took was donating remdesivir and and so that was really from an immediate need standpoint so working very closely um, with all levels of government in india the embassy of course in washington and all around the world we were able to provide over 450,000 vials of remdesivir to the indian government very quickly actually um, in early april to to in sorry late april i should say um, to to try to at least get that unmet need, immediate unmet need addressed as quickly as possible so that the manufacturers could ramp up their, their process. Um, the last piece I would just add is in addition to remdesivir, another need that, that's come out of India because of the increased hospitalization has been um, the fact that there's been an increasing number of cases of mucormycosis and the need for that is ambazone. And, and so, that was also one that we've been working with the partners with Mylan, with Beatrice in India to make sure that we can increase their supply. And so we've been partnering with them to make sure that happens um, to, um, to support the Indian patients as well. So both of those pieces have been part of our response. Um, we're glad to say that all the shipments of remdesivir have gone out. Um, many shipments of Amazon have gone out as well. Um, the government's been amazing to make that happen. Uh, forum for having us on this panel in an important discussion. I think when we talk about partnerships and when we talk about partnerships, especially from India, between India and the United States, I think our company is an uh, excellent case study. I think we're 25 years old. Um, we're a small vaccine company based out of Hyderabad in India. Uh, we have several vaccines on the market. But pretty much everything that we have done and everything that we have learned so far is purely because of our partnerships. I mean, when we look around, we have probably more than 30 or so partnerships from around the world. About half of them are from uh, the in uh, United States, uh, organizations based in the US, universities, NIH, uh, CDC, et cetera. And several of those partnerships are due to the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program. Uh, Dr. Renu Swaroop mentioned that, and several of those partnerships are because of that. And you know, 
what partnerships are about is i would say uh, mentorship for us and it is relationships you know we along the way we've developed good relationships with people like dr mk ban uh, dr roger glass from the cdc and nih uh, harry greenberg from stanford university and george curlin from the niaid for whom we all worked together for our to develop our rotavirus vaccine and we also had a excellent relationship and a partnership with uh, dr john robbins from the niaid who you know worked with us for our typhoid vaccine in the early days and later on we went on to create a typhoid conjugate vaccine what is you know what we learned from this partnership the indo us vaccine action program where we developed our rotavirus vaccine is you know how to run projects how to manage you know multifaceted multi continent or multi country projects um, you know how you design clinical trials you know how you conduct um, you know high end good quality research but that's translatable eventually to a product all of this has resulted in you know us conducting clinical trials pretty much now more than in 20 countries um almost close to a million subjects in different trials around the world and this has all resulted in about 70 or so publications so far you know for us as a company when we publish internationally and that is peer reviewed you know that's a you know great honor for us and and this is a never ending process you know we started out with the partnerships for our typhoid vaccines and uh, rotavirus vaccines with the NIAID and NIH CDC and it um now we have ongoing programs for non typhoidal salmonella for which we have partnered with um, the University of Maryland at Baltimore Mike Levine and Kathy Newsel's group uh we're also working with the Merck Hillman labs to work on um on hill call uh, a cholera vaccine uh, for india and many other parts of the developing world and we're also working with uh, gsk to work on their malaria vaccine you know we will be the will be receiving technology from gsk and we wish we will be manufacturing it in india and uh, you know for supplying it to several other parts of the world you know coming specifically to our rotavirus vaccine project you know i was uh, you know I, i mean 20 years ago when i joined bharat biotech i was specifically hired as a project manager for the rotavirus vaccine project and as i was managing this project you know all the stalwarts that i just mentioned dr ban harry greenberg roger glass i mean i was literally a minion in the room understanding what these people are thinking and saying to each other and saying you know how they're conducting the project and i can't say that it, i understood anything but 20 years later thinking back about what they how they guided us how they did what they did today that's you know enough of an ammunition for us to do what we are doing today you know to develop new vaccines to develop new projects you know so that's that's how you know the system works and that's how the partnership between india and the united states has worked that's how the indo us vaccine action program has worked and it's just it's not just rotavirus vaccine and a typhoid vaccine but you know several other vaccines that we've been working on and these partnerships also enable us to do bold things you know if you take a rotavirus vaccine you know uh, many company there are a couple of two or three companies you know in the world that are making rotavirus vaccines but we looked at our own vaccine and said you know the dose volume should be lowered so that it can be easily delivered in at least in poor countries in india and africa so instead of having a you know a 2 ml or a 2.5 ml dose volume we we have, we have tried our best to reduce it to a half ml dose volume and that's working really well because we can package more doses in a vial and we can you know reduce the cost of manufacturing and shipping and that we have done very successfully when it comes to typhoid vaccine specifically we partnered with obviously dr john robbins in the early days in the early 2000s uh today we've developed a conjugate vaccine that was tested uh at the university of oxford by andy pollard's group through a grant from the gates foundation um and once that human challenge study was completed um we immediately were able to conduct global effectiveness studies again with partnership with uh, andy pollard and uh, kathy newso uh, with funding again from the gates foundation where we are able to evaluate effectiveness of this typhoid conjugate vaccine in more than five or six countries and about 600,000 subjects you know burkina faso malawi nepal 
Pakistan, um, Bangladesh, and India. So these partnerships are enabled because we have, um, you know, a, a goal and an interest to partner with um, global entities, and that that is what has kept us going. And coming specifically to COVID vaccines, uh, we've been on the forefront developing a whole virion vaccine with partnership with um, the Indian Council of Medical Research and the National Institute of Virology, where we received the strains from and did a lot, lot of active um, research back and forth. And we also have a BSL-3 uh, containment facility. So we were immediately able to bring in uh, these strains and adapt them into Vero cells and manufacture a, a good quality vaccine that's highly purified, that has a very, very good safety profile. And it doesn't end there because we learned about partnerships with the NIAID and NIH. Uh, we were able to partner with a company called Virovax, which had an adjuvant um, for, you know, it's an alum based adjuvant, but it had an agonist molecule called uh, TLR7 and 8 agonist. And this was developed by the, you know, NIAID with more than 10 or 15 years of research. And it was licensed to Virovax and we have eventually able to license it and to be included as a part of our vaccine. And that is helping this whole Virion vaccine, you know, uh, present itself and give cell mediated immunity, which is very important memory, memory immune response. So I think this is, this is an ongoing process. It doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. I think both countries have an excellent um, working relationship because many of us lived and worked in the US. I myself was in the US for more than 18 years. Uh, did undergrad, master's, and MBA in the U.S. and also worked there before I came back to India. So this, I think, partnership between the two countries, I think it's it's very robust and uh, it should be continued. And and the reverse drain of knowledge and information has also started. As you know, we have partnered with a company called Ocugen in the United States. Uh, we have licensed Covaxin to them for the United States and Canada. And they are, uh, we are in the process of tech transferring our QC assays, our drug substance manufacturing and the drug product manufacturing, you know, back to Ocugen so that this vaccine can be made in the US. And the benefit of this vaccine is that Covaxin, we can also, uh, we're also conducting clinical trials on younger age groups, uh, children as low as two years of age to 12 years of age. So this will be a benefit uh, not just for India, but for U.S. and also many other um, entities around the world. And we're also working with other entities uh, to develop COVID vaccines. We're working with Washington University, St. Louis, to develop an intranasal uh, COVID vaccine, adenovirus vector-based vaccine. Uh, we've partnered with Thomas Jefferson University to use our rabies virus vector as a platform to deliver novel proteins. Um, so there are several partnerships that are underway. But I think uh, we are an excellent case study of partnerships. And I think someday when the pandemic is behind us, I think at least I would like to sit down and pen some thoughts on how these partnerships have helped us uh, through these years. Thank you and over. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Prasad. Let me uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Julie from uh, Merck to her opening remarks and begin the Q&A. Thank you. Um, you know, Merck is a US-based life sciences company that is known outside the United States and Canada as MSD. We have a really long tradition of leadership in infectious diseases, including vaccines, antivirals, antibacterials, antifungals, antiparasitics in both our human and animal health businesses. But we also have a very long tradition of engagement in all kinds of partnerships with our Indian colleagues. Um, two that I'll just briefly mention. Yeah, one is the MSD Wellcome Trust joint venture, the nonprofit joint venture that really is a scientific attempt to try to repurpose or create vaccines that are specifically targeted people in lower income countries. Another effort is the MSD for Mothers program in India, which has contributed a great deal of experience in supporting Indian investigators, experts, and clinicians in improving rural health care in the private sector, but also improving the quality standards and the trainings around maternal mortality, and have really moved the needle on the dial on that one. So our partnerships are familiar, longstanding, and I think mutually beneficial. 
fast forward to where we are today in the unfolding uh, crisis of the surge of coronavirus cases and its aftermath in India. And I think all of us who have been in the middle of this experience for a long time recognize that this is all hands on deck to try to contribute whatever we can. Broadly speaking, Merck has contributed about $12 million so far to support um, purchase of oxygen generators, ventilators, and so on. We've also arranged to import some uh, additional doses of, of our um, posiconazole generic and formulated products so that there's better availability of treatment for the mucormycosis that is complicating so many patients, particularly those with diabetes. But I think our, our hope is that our oral uh, antiviral drug, malonipiravir, which is in phase three studies in the United States, um, will prove to be a useful product and will be available as soon as possible in India and to that end, because what we would not want to have happen is to ultimately have an authorized antiviral, but then have a delay in manufacturing and distribution in the place where this oral drug is needed probably the most. Um, we were able to initiate several voluntary license agreements with Indian generic companies um, that we have a lot of confidence in. They have track records and um, already history of high quality manufacturing, of course. But the idea is um, we're not just transferring the voluntary license, we're working collaboratively, sharing data from our phase two studies, um, contributing to the design of the phase three clinical trials in India, and trying to be helpful to the regulatory process so that the study design and the endpoints and so forth meet the requirements of the Indian government. So we, you know, we want to, I want to specify that right now, this is not an approved drug, but it is an oral drug and our early experience suggests that it would be useful in preventing severe disease and potentially useful as a post-exposure prophylactic drug for people who've been exposed but not yet manifesting symptoms of coronavirus infection. And given the rural health needs in India, an oral formulation of an antiviral might be particularly helpful. Hence the leaning in to the manufacturing and the hope that we can get this drug um, in the hands or mouths of the people who need it if and when it is proven to be successful. So I just want to kind of also um, comment on some additional steps to try to accelerate the availability of other countermeasures in India. Obviously, vaccines are critically important. Merck is working to manufacture Johnson & Johnson's vaccine, and we imagine that a significant proportion of that supply um, will be globally useful. And so our hope is that that's another way that we will be contributing to the overall global supply situation as quickly as we possibly can. We've made macro investments, literally are working 24 seven to speed up both the bulk production as well as the form fill of, of that product for Johnson & Johnson. Um, beyond that though, I think we're collaborating with others in the life sciences industry to really make sure that we um, effectively communicate the other things that need to be done to help um, improve the access to, um, to countermeasures and particularly vaccines. Um, as many of you know, the IFPMA has outlined five steps that are supported by pharma, bio, and several other organizations. The first step is, of course, to accelerate dose sharing. Uh, that's the highest topic on the radar screen across, I think, all countries and one that continues to move in the right direction, although not as fast as we would wish. We also need to optimize production, and that means really um, looking at what we practically can do to work in series, not in parallel, without compromising any of the safety or compliance requirements and also assuring that we have the raw materials and the components to quickly develop vaccines. The third issue is to support the readiness of countries to be able to use vaccines. We, I think we've all seen many examples where vaccines are actually available, but there's no system of adult immunization and really um, very limited ability to roll them out quickly. We also have to eliminate some trade barriers um, that really make it difficult. As CEPI has called for, um, we need to create independent platforms to really identify um, what the gaps are and to support 
um, better movement of uh, products as well as API through the various um, trade associations. And then finally, I think it goes back to the importance of simply driving further innovation um, to stay on top of vaccines and vaccine variants as they evolve. But I hate to say it, I think we also need to look ahead down the road. We've already seen the emergence of three coronaviruses of human health consequence. Several others are lurking out there. And as we learn more about this family of viruses, I think we have to be prepared for an ongoing need for further innovation in this category, as well as potentially other viruses that have now demonstrated their propensity to be able to spread very quickly around the world. So I'll stop there and just thank you for supporting this whole collaborative effort, but also for including the industry perspective in the panel and for all that you are doing to help um, accelerate solutions and the availability of countermeasures in India. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate uh, everybody. And I know it's a panel discussion, and I also looked at the time. Uh, we are kind of out of time, but I'll still uh, pose one, one question to each one of you. Let me just start. Uh, with with uh, Johanna from Gilead, you have an interesting uh, uh, model of IP, and we saw that at Hep C, especially for emerging market. And, and so the my question is is during the COVID emergency, how do you basically protect the IP at the same time be able to provide access to people so their lives are protected? How do you manage that in Gilead? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think there's a lot of talk about that right now, right, in the system. Um, the, I, we believe that the U.S. innovation eco ecosystem really enabled Gilead to build on its antiviral expertise. And, and that's that IP protection provides a certain level of certainty. Um, while, you, you know, Gilead and many other companies um, take on some risky, significant investments conducting R&D activities when it comes to um, viral diseases. And, and so that's what actually resulted in remdesivir, right? If you think about the background and how that all played out. Voluntary licensing is one solution to this. And, and it's the one that Gilead has kind of um, adopted, not only for HIV, HCV, but most recently for COVID-19. Um, but it's founded on the security provided by those IP protections that I just referred to. So one can't go without the other. And, and, and so the response to the India second wave was only possible because of that transfer of knowledge with those voluntary licensing agreements that we had with generic manufacturers in India. And so, so it, it, it's, it's not one or the other. And, and I, I, I would assume that it's not the only solution, but that's definitely one of them. And so that's why the proposals um, you know, at the WTO to waive IP rights would remove really important incentives for companies just like Gilead to continue to invest in these types of partnerships like voluntary licensing and research into new variants, diagnostics, vaccines, et cetera. And um, I think would disincentivize the industry to think about pandemic preparedness. And as somebody mentioned earlier, it, it's um, unfortunately, we, this might not be the last one and we need to be ready. And so making sure that those, that R&D, that discovery and research continues in this space is really important. And that's why it's a yin and a yang. So you need to make sure that you have the IP protection. And at the same time, that's what offers the opportunity to do the voluntary licensing that I referred to, to have access um, across all low and middle income countries, as well as the developed countries. And I, I think that's just really key for us moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Let me come to uh, Mr. Prasad. You know, Bharat Biotech, uh, you've come in live and light, especially with your uh, COVID vaccine. And you talked about how you're licensing uh, in the U.S. and also in Canada. Uh, how do you manage uh, the quality perception, brand perception? Because, uh, you know, India has taken the lead in trying to provide this vaccine at a low, very low cost so they can supply it to the rest of the world. So how do you manage the brand perception? The brand perception is based out of, uh, you know, reality. You know, we have this concept in our company where we talk about, you know, perception is reality, whether that's R&D or quality or manufacturing or ethics, uh, whatever it is. So I think there is no exception to, you know, good quality product or good science or good uh, data that's being generated from any of, any of our work. 
and there is absolutely no um, uh, you know there's nothing else that we can do other than doing that but where we come out ahead as indian companies is that our efficiencies are designed to be able to develop vaccines and to manufacture it at the kind of scales that we can do so that uh, it's uh, it's uh, given at an affordable price and as you know our own vaccine and the vaccine from the serum institute of india both of us supply to the government of india at a very very low price you know it's almost like a no profit no loss price but then we're able to have a differential pricing strategy for state governments and for the private markets having said that you know it's almost that 80% or 90% of our product that we are manufacturing today is being supplied to the national government and the state governments and less than 10% of the product that we are manufacturing today we supply to private markets at a higher price so i think this is a model that we have evolved over the years uh, supply to governments unicef gavi at 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 a sustainable price but at a at a at a very affordable price point but then try to seek higher price points in um, you know in foreign countries or in the private markets in india thank you thank you and finally uh, uh you know uh, julie from your perspective mark has taken the lead in in providing sub licensing to indian generic uh, uh drug makers on a lot of uh, pandemic uh, uh medicines itself uh how do you manage your ip as you try to percolate uh, and bring scalability. You know, I'm just sitting here thinking that it was 40 years ago this week that the first report of what we now recognize was AIDS was published. And I think back over those 40 years, where would we be in the world if it weren't for the Indian generic manufacturers of the antiretroviral medications that have saved so many lives, not just through PEPFAR, but in uh, lower middle income countries and middle income countries as well. So you know, this is part of the global ecosystem. And I think um, it really builds on the concept of differential pricing. Um, we need to be able to sustain our business models and get a fair return on the high risk investments that we make. But at the same time, we all recognize we have a responsibility to try to improve the access to our life-saving medications, particularly in the people who need them the most. So I think the philosophy is really how do we um, square that circle or circle that square in a sense to assure that we um, have fair pricing, but at the same time balance that with availability at an affordable price in the areas that need it. And right now, India is in, uh, in, in high need of all countermeasures for COVID, but also the licenses that we were able to execute with the Indian gen uh, generic manufacturers are also um, going to be able to provide product for more than 100 other countries. So I think that's one of our strategies is to um, work through that differential system. And, um, you know, it's not easy. It's always controversial. Um, some people think that it's not fast enough or the price isn't low enough. Other people have the opposite point of view, depending on where you sit on the spectrum. But it's part of the ecosystem that we operate in, and we're very committed to doing that. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm Again, uh, our time is up way beyond. So I just want to say thank you to uh, uh, you know Julie, Joanna, and Sai for taking the time. Uh, I think uh, we should have one more session, just specifically the industry, as to what you're doing between India and the US. It's very fascinating to see the collaboration taking place. And I see a lot of potential as we move forward. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ambassador Taranji Singh, for organizing this and, and opening it. And once again, thank you to all of you. Wish you well and be safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.